Hey, I'm Matthew Moran, and you're listening to Chana 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 Podcast. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of my podcast. We have a very special guest today joining all the way from Los Angeles, California. We have Mr. Matthew Moran joining the podcast. Hi, Matthew. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How about you? Good. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I, I really appreciate it. So how's the weather Weather like there? I know that there are some places in the U.S. is facing a lot of cold weather these days, right? <laughs> yeah, my, my oldest son is in Chicago. They're really facing cold weather, which is funny because we went out today and I think it was, I took the dog out in the morning. It was 50 degrees. I was like, oh, it's chilly, you know, but I really can't complain at 50 degrees, right? Right. And I think we got up sunny and 65. It was pretty nice today. Right. <clears throat> so how is the situation where you're staying with, with the COVID and everything? Is is it easing up the restrictions now? My daughter just sent me something. I haven't really seen what the stats are. Um, you know, it was pretty bad a few weeks ago. Uh with the holiday surge, post-holiday surge, a lot of people in the hospital. Um, we actually had some family members that were pretty sick, my girlfriend in particular, and uh, she lost a cousin about seven weeks ago to COVID. So, right. um, yeah, so it's pretty, you know, the personal impact on us, pretty minimal, but in the family, you know, they, they've, they've definitely felt it. We've been, we've stayed safe though. Right. <clears throat> So uh, with with all this uh, happening, uh, when did you last perform live? Wow, uh, I've done a few live streams. Um, I think my band performed right at the end of 2019, which is very odd. <laughs> um, you know, it's a it's a strange situation because we're having these conversations, and actually, I'm talking to somebody right now about a tour. Uh, at the end of summer, because we're certainly hoping hoping that a lot more things open up, and so we're starting to make the plans now. But it's been it's been too long. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> now you know, on the upside, it's um, you know the other work I do. I think you read up a little bit. I I do technology work, and right. um, in that regard, as a matter of fact, people say all the time, "How has it impacted you work wise?" And I said, "Well." I, I work remotely. I This is what I do. So <laughs> being on Zoom, this is all normal stuff to me. And in many ways, it's like nothing's changed there, right? You know, so where some people are struggling to figure out how do I work from home or how do I, I've been doing it for 20 years. And so things feel very normal for me. My, my girlfriend, on the other hand, she's starting to do uh some web work and other stuff so for her it's a new experience to go wait i wake up and my commute is walking to the coffee machine that's my commute in the morning yes <laughs> yeah yeah that, it's funny when it's like 10 second commute to work right so <laughs> i tell them i say i say traffic is when i have to step over my dog you know that's that's my traffic right <clears throat> Uh, so Matthew, can you tell me a little bit about uh, about your childhood and how you grew up, and then a little bit about how do you got into music? Sure. Um, you know, I've always. It's funny because I'm once again I keep mentioning Debbie, my girlfriend, and I've been teaching her guitar. She's been learning over the last year and a lot. This last during COVID, we have a lot more time to sit around and play guitar. And she said, "Wow, you." you know, rhythm seems so natural for you. And I said, well, you have to understand from the time I was four or five years old, I, my dad was a banjo player and he had an amazing, this low booming voice and he did a lot of folk music. And um, one of my earliest memories is him recording uh, Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind on the little cassette recorder. And I just carried that thing. I took, I wore that cassette out. You know, it was, it was an amazing I wish I could find it. I, I'm sure it's, you know, long, this is 1970. Um, but I would spend a lot of time, one of the things he'd let me do is drum on the, the drum part of the banjo while he was playing. And that really, you know, just connected me with the music. And, um, 
and so I knew I wanted to play and I took a little, a few piano lessons from a neighbor there. He was actually the, he was the piano player for the Playboy Mansion in the 70s. So he must have seen some wild things in his time, but he was this older man, Mr. Gandhi, and taught me some piano. And then one day I, I said to my dad, I said, you know, I, I want to learn to play guitar. And his encouragement was, well, there's a guitar that, you know, your mom doesn't use that I bought. Um, there's a book of chords and you can learn how to tune it. And here's the songs I play. And he had a Pete Seeger banjo book, uh, how to play the five string banjo. And I just started learning, you know, the songs out of that book so that I could play along with him. Right. <clears throat> so what are the other sort of music you, you were listening to back then? What, what, what? Well, I had uh, three older brothers and my oldest brother in particular, um, you know, was really into like UFO and, and of course, you know, Rod Stewart, Zeppelin. So as a little kid, I was kind of getting those influences through my dad. I was listening to Gordon Lightfoot and, um, uh, and then really my friend's mother she used to take we had a cabin up in the mountains we'd go skiing and she would often be the one that drove us up there and she had, Simon and Garfunkel and Jim Croce were really big with her right so I I feel very fortunate because I feel like I had these influences kind of from all over the place um and you know I still try and do the same I I try to be musically open to listening to other influences you know I don't want to I what I don't want to be is that angry old guy saying music when I was a kid was better than ever you know like right. because my daughter and I were looking on YouTube she's a singer and we were looking on YouTube a few years ago and watch you looking at some video of a band from the 90s and you could see people making comments that are saying this is when music was great and I said oh my gosh that's what guys my age sound like they say it about their you know everybody says it so i I've tried to, you know, continue to find new music today so right. that, because there's great music being made today, just like there's great music being made, you know, 40 years ago and the Beatles were great and, you know, Buddy Holly was great. And I just try and make sure that I stay, um, you know, willing to listen to it. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel that also because a lot of, uh, especially like, what I listen to like metal and my friends like metal heads, they're kind of always living in the nostalgia. Like right? they, they don't really look at the new bands. They don't uh, even, they'll just say, Oh, there's no great music now, but they don't actually look for it or they don't even listen to it. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's kind of, you know, you see things come kind of full circle. You see people that really, discover you know my daughter like I mentioned she's a singer and we had uh we live in LA and so um a few years ago she wanted to attend a performing arts school downtown and so we moved right into the heart of downtown so she could attend this performing arts school which was an amazing experience and you know she grew up listening to music as I was you know influencing her and playing and things I was listening to we took them to concerts and then when we moved down there, I said, you control the radio, you control the music in the house. So I want to hear your music as a constant influence, which turned me on to Panic at the Disco and Fall Out Boy, which is not what I was normally listening to, right? And I, and I loved it. As a matter of fact, it, it influenced my music. With my band, I would literally sometimes come in and I say, listen to this transitional you know, drum part. I'd go to my drummer, I'd go, listen to this. I want to do something like that here. Like that's, let's, Let's emulate that, right? And so, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I just, and then my daughter, she'll be listening to music and she'll be listening to Peggy Lee, you know, and Otis Redding. And then on the next thing, she's listening to Haley and, you know, whoever else she's listening to. So I, I appreciate that because I'm, I hope that I've had an influence on letting her not have a, kind of myopic and closed view of music. I, I don't think art should be viewed that way. Right. right. <clears throat> so Matt, can you tell me also a little bit about how did you get into performing and you know, what was your sort of journey? 
Sure. Um, you know, I started off and uh, like I mentioned, I started playing guitar very young and almost immediately I started writing songs, probably horrible songs. I don't think I have it. I, I still have songs from high school that I, that I play, but um, I've always loved words. I've always been fascinated with words. And I, I know we're going to mention that I sent you the information, but I'm, I'm an author as well. And I've written a couple of books published through Pearson. So words were a big part of my, um, you know, kind of my, they, they dominated my, yeah, I guess, mental and emotional landscape. So when I started playing music, it was very natural for me to start putting words down to these chords I was playing. And I, I never really viewed myself as a singer. As, as, you know, I, I always viewed other people as having that talent. So I was gonna write music and play guitar. And, and so I had bands in high school. Um, and then a little bit after, you know, after high school I had a band and I was writing the originals, but I had somebody else singing it. And then um, you know, got busy raising a family. And so in the time that I was raising a family, I just, I kept writing music, but I wasn't performing out. And around, we moved to, we left LA and moved to Arizona and we moved to this town, Cape Creek, which is north of Phoenix, but right abuts up to Phoenix. But it's a really cool music town. And it had a lot of different honky tonks to play and wine bars and different places. So there's all these great musicians there. And one day we happened upon this uh, wine bar called Cape Creek Coffee Company. I talk about it a lot because it had a big influence on me and they had an open mic and just really talented musicians that were in there. And what was cool about it is they also had that connected to the, the coffee house was the restaurant and wine bar, but then they had a 200 and 50 seat auditorium behind it where national acts would come through. So songwriters like Sean Mullins or Colin Hay from Men at Work would play there mm. doing more acoustic sets, rarely a full band, sometimes one accompanist. And so I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go play that open mic. I'm going to take some of my songs there. And what was really nice about it is, so I started getting out and playing there and, and almost immediately, you know, I, I have some relatively strong material and I'm pretty confident about it. And the owner of Cape Creek Coffee Company, which also owned the restaurant, what he would do is he'd come into this listening room where he had this open mic and you'd have people from the restaurant waiting to be seated. They'd come in there and listen. And it was a true listening room. You didn't come in there to talk. You came in to listen to the music. And so they might, before they were seated, they go, you know, listen to music. Maybe they'd go have dinner. Afterwards, they might come back and watch a little bit more music. And like I said, there were some talented artists there. Unfortunately, the Cape Creek Coffee Company closed down, but still it, it sits you know, pretty strongly in my heart as a big influence on me getting out and playing. Because what happened is uh, the owner, Brian, he approached me and he said, hey, I, I like your stuff. Would you like to play the wine bar? And that's a paid gig. And so, um, you know, I, suddenly I'm going, oh, I'm being paid to play my music. That's that's cool. And so I started playing the wine bar and then I really, I, I just fell in love with it. I mean, I've always liked, you know, speaking and being on stage. So there was no challenge there. I have no stage fright. So it became a very natural transition for me to say, I want to take this more seriously. And I, I've put this off for a long time. I've, I, I've raised four kids. Um, you know, I'm going to, and my kids had been encouraging me to play out more anyways. They were like, dad, you got to go play your music. And so, um, yeah, so that, that, that kind of started it. And then I started just pitching myself to other places in the area, other coffee houses, other wine bars, and that was kind of, that's what got the ball rolling. I, I really look at Cave Creek Coffee Company as a huge influential, um, you know, just opportunity and exposure to performing. Right. <clears throat> so when did the Aragon Sage happen? So I, 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 I had moved to Arizona and um, while in Arizona, went through a divorce and that really was part of the impetus to start playing. The marriage was 
struggling and my kids were saying, go play music. And, and so, um, like I said, we had been, um, I'm from California originally, you know, born and raised right around Los Angeles. And after the marriage broke up, by then I was playing and I was recording music and I toured through New Mexico and Colorado and played some other places. I, but then um, my ex-wife was moving back to California. My youngest lived with her at the time. The other kids lived with me. And so, but my two oldest were 18, they were moving out. And so I said, well, I, I'm gonna move back to California too. I wanna be near my youngest for sure. And so I moved back to California. And when I was there, I, I, you know, I, I got a chance to play with some other musicians. I did at C4 too, but in California, I had some opportunities to play. And I said, you know, I, I like having a band back me up sometimes. I like playing solo, going to continue doing that. And I love having a band back me up. And so I started finding players. I found a great drummer. He was one of the first people I found. Um, and at the time we were called the Matt Moran band. It was just, you know, so my song, kind of my ideas and vision, but he's got a lot of great musical chops and, you know, years of experience. And then, you know, we're looking around for, you know, a guitar player and bass player. And I walked into a music store um, and this music store is kind of funny. It's got your regular guitar wall, and then it's got the expensive guitar room that's normally locked. You have to ask them to open it. And that that was open. So I walked in and this guy was sitting there playing music and he said, uh, he said, oh, you gotta try that Taylor. It's like $6,000, it sounds beautiful. And so I grabbed this guitar and I start playing and I play one of my songs and he starts accompanying me just very naturally, amazing sound wonderful guitar player and I'm looking going wow this sounds really good you know and so I finished the song and he goes man that's a that's a nice tune who wrote that or who yeah whose song is that and I said that's my song he goes really he goes play me another one and so we went through a few songs uh I think by the second song somebody from the mu the music store walked in and goes are you guys an act and I said well as of 10 minutes ago we are you know we, we are now and so I asked him you know if he'd if he played in a band and he said, no, nah, it's just a, it's just a hobby. You know, I did some stuff in the eighties and nineties in studios, but you know, that, that kind of didn't work out or whatever. Real, real modest guy. Um, as it turns out, his name is Steve Schmidt and his father is Al Schmidt, the engineer for Capitol records. He's won like 23 Grammys and this guy's a legend in the business, you know, and that's wow. his dad. I'm going, oh, okay. He's got some musical, lineage you know yeah and so he joined the band and we found a bass player and we went a few years as the Matt Moran band and then um we really just wanted to brand it differently um and I have a I have a I have a tendency to have a because I work in technology a lot of information to help people they'll call me up and and but I also have a tendency to be a little snarky, I guess, to come across as arrogant. I try and do it in fun, but it's just how it is. And so somebody said, I was helping them with something, and they said, "Oh, you're a, uh, you're you're like a sage of of information." I said, "Yeah, I know it." And they go, "Kind of an arrogant one." And I said, "Arrogant sage." I, I think there's a. I think there's a band name there and that's how the band name came about We're literally in a chat on Facebook. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> I also noticed uh, Matt that you actually have your own publishing company as well, right? Yeah, well, what happened is as we saw what was happening in the music business. So going back to the Arizona days, really, um, you know, I had built technology and marketing technology, social media for companies back in 2005, 2006. I, I had a blog that was extraordinarily popular on careers in technology called Notes from the Toolshed. And so I was speaking at events about social media, teaching businesses how to do this. And I guess, you know, 2008, I was playing out a lot. And I suddenly said, you know, if I'm going to treat this like a business, 
what would I consult myself to do? What would I tell myself to do? And I said, well, I'd, I'd have a website for my music and I'd have these social media outlets. And I, you know, I created a list of things. I kind of created a business plan. I, and I went online and looked at what other people were doing and thought, oh, that's a good idea. And, and so suddenly I had a mailing list I was building and all this stuff and, and these other musicians who were established. They were performing across the country that I'd meet through C4, through Cave Creek Coffee Company. It was called C4, Cave Creek Coffee Company. So that's what they called it. Mm -hmm. So um, they started asking me, well, how do you do this? How do you set this up? And I started helping them do that. And after a while, when I, when I looked with what I want to do with my music, I thought, well, maybe I can sell it as a publisher, but, you know, maybe I can sell it to a publisher, get a deal. And then I said, I, once again, seeing how the business went and kind of how I went about getting my book deal, which I, I imagine we'll talk about at some point, um, and, and how my writing career went, which was very hands-on, I'm going to take control of it. I said, you know, and also, you know, I, conversations with Emiko, you know, Emiko from Yay Plus. And so um, she and I have known each other for many years and um, we'd have these conversations and she's like, look, you have all the smarts you've put together business before. You should just maintain all your publishing and you should, that should be you, you know, she, and, and she wasn't the only one, but she was one of the ones that really advocated for that. And when I saw where the business was going, I, I said, you know, why not? why shouldn't I pursue this? And so that's kind of how that came about. Yeah, so it's I mean, really mostly an outlet for my music and ultimately eventually for my daughter and stuff that I'm recording for her. Yeah. I mean, especially now, nowadays where it's, it's very hard to protect your music, right? Because people just use it. Uh, they don't really care about, you know, uh, so it's very important to have that. Yeah. <clears throat> so for sure. Um, yeah, so yeah. when I, I saw your website, I saw this photo of you in the website with a with this cool Johnny Cash T-shirt, uh, and it really reminds me that you you captured that rebel black, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, Johnny. Cash. I, know, I realize I'm wearing black now, and I think you're not supposed to on camera, right? My man is always says, "Oh, don't wear," you know, like you disappear. I'm just a moving head, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, did you ever listen to Johnny Cash? How? Uh... For sure. It, interestingly enough, I'm I'm probably more of a fan of like Chris Christopherson, who wrote Sunday Morning Coming Down and was recorded by Johnny Cash. Right. Um, but yeah, a lot of that acoustic influence was really big and still is. I mean, I'm still, um, you know, right now, probably my favorite artists are like Joe Pug. He's a folk. I call it folk rock. I don't know. It's more contemporary, you know, it's, um, but Joe Pug and uh, Josh Ritter and, but then like Jason Isbell, which is kind of that Texas dirt road country rock kind of sound. Not like, I'm not a big fan of like the kind of bro country trap beats, like where it sounds kind of like they're trying to be hip hop, just not very good hip hop. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> that, that's kind of, there's that country music. But then there's like Jason Isbell that I consider a little more meaty, you know, so that, um, it, you know, and I have a song that uh, Lonely Mile Man that really was stylized um, as, you know, I, I kind of was channeling Johnny Cash, you know, when I wrote the song, I, I wanted that kind of a vibe and the feel. So, you know, he, he was a part of it, but um, other songwriters too, I, I, you know, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I listen to some of your music. Uh, there are a few in Spotify and you have a lot on your website as well. Uh, what I like about them, especially your words, uh, because you tend to use very simple uh, words to express and you're not talking in like, uh, you know, metaphors or anything. You're just simply saying what you're feeling. And that's what I really loved about your songs. All right, I appreciate that. It, you know, what's funny is uh, I've had a fairly easy time of putting words together. It's always been kind of a strong suit. And I've written poetry and had different things published in that vein. And 
what I love most about songwriting is um, don't tell me too much feel me more you know what I mean like like give me the feeling give me the emotional gravity and I don't need a lot of details I'm always I'm always put off by songs that you know go into too much narrative about the event instead mm. allude to the event and there are um you know just when I think of my favorite songs I want a song that only touches a little bit on the event but you don't even really know what happened but you know the feeling you know I, I mentioned Chris Christopherson Sunday morning coming down he, it says I woke up Sunday morning with no way to hold my head that didn't hurt and the beer I had for breakfast wasn't bad so I had one more for dessert you've learned everything you need to know about that guy like right. you now know the state <laughs> of mind he's in and what he's about right he didn't have to go into a lot of detail you know right <laughs> um i love this song uh, your song take your cares away can you tell me a little bit about that song oh yeah well that that came out of the pandemic <laughs> and so um so debbie and i were at my house in la i've now i've since moved so i used to live right in downtown um because my daughter was attending that school but now she's out she's in college and so I've now moved north of LA uh, with, with Debbie, we live together. And, and so, but at that time, it was right at the start of the pandemic, the lockdown had just started. And we had actually, we were not living together. We had actually driven up the coast and you were starting to hear about this, you know, about COVID, right? But there were no lockdowns. There was no, there's no real sense of, what was going on in the rest of the world. I, we can all have our reasons why we think that was the case in our country. I think we were a little late to the game, but um, so we, we did this trip, went up the coast and we got back and then everything started shutting down and we were sitting in our house um, during a rainstorm. And so, uh, you know, it's pouring rain and we have our window open and we're just kind of looking out on the street. I lived on this street where kind of near, even though it was right in downtown, it was on a couple acres and it backed up to a park. So there were coyotes and owls and all kinds of crazy stuff there. And so we were just sitting there looking out at the street and playing guitar. Cause we often sit around in bed and just play guitar. And I teach her some new songs or something. And I started playing with a chord progression and very simple. And she goes, I really, I, I like that. You need to write a song to that now you know, I'll, full disclosure, we were, um, the song is autobiographical, right? So we, we were, I mentioned smoking pot and it's legal in California. Don't get angry at me, <laughs> right. but we were, that's what we were doing. And so, um, and we had this red subdued light on where we were just kind of sitting there. And so I wanted to, I said, and once again, it's one of those things where I wanted to write a song about the pandemic, but not about the pandemic. I don't mention it at all. And so that's why it started out very, it almost started as a joke. I said in the red lit room, you know, smoking some dope, my girl and I are um, visiting, she's giving me hope. Mm -hmm. The city is silent though, she weeps and she moans. The sound of the rain ain't all that's keeping us home. So I was just talking about us being stuck at the house right. and I wanted to paint a picture of it, but it was really because of the pandemic. That's how that came about. <laughs> right. So when I uh, when I was um, you know sort of doing a research on on for this podcast, so I I watched your I went to your website and so you have your musical career which is uh, which I first got interested. But when I look at your other things that you are doing outside of thing, music is quite interesting. You have an equal career in IT and you're an author, so. Uh, can you tell me about your IT side of things? How, uh, when did you started in that career? Mm -hmm. So growing up, I always said I was going to be an author. That, that's what I believed I was going to be. It's what I love doing. It's what I still love doing. I love putting words onto paper, writing essays, poetry, songs. It's all the same. What happened is, um, and this kind of relates to why I, 
started Arrogant Sage Music and Publishing, it, it, it's kind of the same approach. So um, in high school, I, I was, you know, I wasn't a great student. I was, I was really good at English, really good at history because I love them. Not so good at math, not because I didn't like it or appreciate it. I just, it bored me for the most part. And so I just focused my attention in these areas. I, I used to have a teacher, a geometry teacher who would challenge me. He, we'd have arguments about what's more important, you know, uh, English or math, right? Right. And so, um, so my friend was taking a programming class and one of the first programming classes on an Apple IIe computer. And he came home and he was showing me something and he said, look, you can type your name. It says, what's your name? You type your name and then it blinks on the screen. Okay. And then he showed me the code that made that. And he walked away. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, whatever. And I thought, oh, that's kind of fascinating. And so he had a book there that was this textbook called Basic Apple Basic. It's on an Apple computer. Right. And I sat down and I started learning programming. I never took any classes. I actually did all his homework for him. Um, he got named his class. I did everything for all his, I, I wrote a, a game at the end, a diving game. It was all text-based, you know, where you select a dive by difficulty and whatever. Right. And you could win a medal, gold, but whatever. And so um, once I never thought it would be something I would do for a living, but I had a lot of books, used books everywhere. And so my dad was really big into books and we'd go to used bookstores and just buy books, that, you know, and I had them in boxes. And so I started numbering the boxes and I wanted to keep track of them because I also had some first editions with Stephen King. And so I wrote a book, I wrote a library program to keep track of my books. And once again, still never thinking of something I was going to do. Um, I got hired at Blue Cross to do data entry because I could type fast. And while I was there, I started automating some things that we were doing. And within nine months, they had moved me to work for this programmer. And they said, you're now working for him. And I've kind of never looked back. So I've never taken any classes on uh, programming, but I've taught quite a few. And my son's now a developer for, I think he's with Capital One, you know, kind of big time developer. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, I, you know, and suddenly I realized, oh my gosh, I'm working for this insurance company and I was contracted to build document assembly systems for law firms. That's really how my career, you know, in that <laughs> day started. Um, and that and that almost directly led to the writing because, you know, I put off writing. So now I was doing technology and kind of dabbling in music, but I said, well, I wanted to write. And so... I wrote an article for a little local paper and it got published. No pay, it was all free. It's one of the things I talk to artists about is don't be afraid to put, you know, I know they say don't play for exposure, but if it's the right exposure, consider it, right? You need to, you need to be wise about your choices, but also if you're not an A-lister, if you don't have a big name, you wanna find a way to get some exposure in the right way. And so that led to another article. And then I wrote an article on careers in technology um, and this magazine bought it. And then they asked me to write a column for them and they paid me every, you know, then I, suddenly I was being paid to write. And mm. that's how that came about. And that kind of steamrolled into the book. Right. <clears throat> so, um, so can you tell me about the book? So I, I believe the book is uh, building your IT career, right? So, uh... yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, one, one second, I'll show you. I don't have the most recent one, Building Your IT Career. The first one was this, okay. the IT Career Builders Toolkit. And um, yeah, I'm very, I'm very proud of it. Um, it. It's a trade paperback. So how that came about, and this once again, it seems unrelated, but I take the same approach with music. It's what you know, I sometimes speak for songs a lot. That's how Emiko and I met actually was at a music conference where I was speaking on social media. She was speaking on songwriting and performing. And, you know, so we just got together and just hit it off. Right. So, um, so the book came about, uh, I started writing these articles about careers in technology and I was building this 
catalog of information about IT careers. And I was answering people's questions on a certification job board, people who were getting their certifications. Now, I, I think certifications have a value, but I don't think they're the most important thing. The most important thing you can do is work on actual projects. That's, I tell everybody, I don't care if you're in school to get an IT degree, go find a company that you can build a solution for. That's how you have to do something in the field. I think I was watching um, uh, David Luckow, Luckow. He was on your podcast just a couple of weeks ago, Luch I think. Yeah, David Luchow, Luchow. Luchow. okay. And he was talking about how you had to jump into it no matter what you tried to learn, getting into the studio and doing something is where you learn. Like that's where you're gonna, you know, trial by fire in a lot of ways. You have right. to get in there and make something happen. And and I really appreciated that because I was like, yeah, that's that's how I view it. So um so I would so I was giving this really proactive advice on careers in IT and I um and I was answering these questions on this job board and pretty soon they would just ask me, they'd just come right to me. They wouldn't even ask generally. They go, hey, can Matt ask, answer this question? You know? And so one day I, I realized I had all of this, all these articles I'd written and all these answers about various topics. And so I told them, I said, hey, I'm gonna organize this into a PDF. Would you guys like that? Like a toolkit. And it was an overwhelming response. So I started giving it out for free and then I realized it was like 220 pages. And I said, I think this is a book. And I pitched it to a publisher in San Francisco and they accepted it. So this is really weird. If you're an author, most people expect to get rejection slips and you're going to go to a lot. I've never seen a rejection slip. I have a couple of books published. I have another book deal with my publisher, you know, like, and I, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I'm very fortunate. Like I just kind of the right things aligned. I met the right people. But I did a few things to position myself properly. And so, um, you know, in all seriousness, I, I pitched the book and, and that publisher came back and they said, we love it. We'd like to do it, but we can't do it for 14 months because of current projects. So in 14 months, we'll kick off that project. And at that point, I was already being asked to speak at University of Phoenix and technical colleges to give career advice. And I said, I need something. I need a book. So I self-published it. Now, after I self-published it, I got exposure for it by getting some free advertisement from the people that were paying me for articles. I said, don't pay me for articles. Give me a half page ad and a banner ad on your website. And I'll write your articles. You don't have to pay me. And they did. And that led to a woman named Mary Beth Gray buying my self-published book. Turns out she was the executive editor at Pearson, which is a big publisher, fourth largest yeah. publisher in the world, I think huge textbook publisher and she sent me an email and we got on the phone and she said we want to publish this book and they paid me a nice advance and that that led to the book deal right <clears throat> so matt so. how how relevant when you release that book and today uh what's the difference uh like what, what advice you given in that book and then what's happening right now? Is it still relevant? How much is it relevant? So what are the big changes? Sure, most, most of it's very relevant. Um, the, cause I, in the book, I'm not talking about technology. I, I, I talk about learning technology, but, I, but the assumption of the book is, look, you're going to have to be good technically. So however you get those skills, get them. Now I, I do mention, you know, if you're in school, get an internship. If you're if you're working for a company and there's an opportunity to take on a new task, take it on. Like, don't don't wait until you're given the pay and the position. Uh, once again, related to, it's funny because it's on my other screen here, the podcast with David Luchow, and you know he he kind of mentioned you know um, you you can't wait until you have all the dots in a row before you jump in and you have to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna produce this, I'm gonna engineer this, and I'm gonna have to learn some things as I go and just kind of fake it till I make it in, in a sense. You have to, you know, you're gonna have to eventually get your hands dirty, your feet wet, whatever the term is. Right. So that's kind of the advice. So that would remain the same, but, um, and so a lot of that, it's really about personal marketing and direct connections. That's really what I'm telling people. And so I would, some of the things I would, 
I would say still do. But one of the things I say to do is, you know, back then I was saying you should, you should attempt to write a blog where you share some of your solutions so that you have something you can point an employer to to say, look, I put myself out there. I create, I solve problems. Now it would be, you should be making videos on YouTube. You should be mm -hmm. showing people how to solve technical problems and, and give it away for free, give away downloads where people can learn this. And that would be the same. It, maybe the medium would change, but the attitude and approach would be very much the same. Right. It, it's funny that you mentioned about the videos because I've been, <clears throat> because of, uh, I, I used to also quite often work, work from home, but uh, now that with the pandemic, it's, it's fully working from home. And then I have to manage my personal device with my company device. So I've been spending a lot of time try to build this workspace, you know, the way I like it. I want it to be minimally. So I've been spending like hours on YouTube looking at all these different people suggesting and then I keep on buying all this stuff and doing different iterations. So it's a, yeah, it's a great way to learn because you learn from other people's experience and then, you know, it, it's, it's a great way of learning actually. Now you don't need to ask anybody, right? You can just learn about things. Well, we, we, uh, this is my girlfriend's camera, but we're trying to figure out some of the new features on it. It's a new mirrorless camera. Right before we got online, I was literally, before I was watching that, I was looking at another video. As a matter of fact, I, I made a video about the fact that I spend 15 to 20 minutes every morning, first thing I do with my coffee, and I look at something to teach me something. It could be music engineering. Mm. It could be marketing on YouTube, or it could be any number of other things. It might be a TED talk, but we have a, a really rich source of, of data, you know, of, of things we could learn. And, and I tell people, you know, I, I speak at events and sometimes music events and people say, well, how would I do this? How do I, I'm going to give you a secret. Here's my secret. Don't let anybody else know, but here's what you do. You type this in your browser, you open up your web browser and you say, www.googe.com. A magical website comes up where you can enter your question, right? <laughs> and it will tell you the answer. And of course, I'm, you know, being facetious, but I'm trying to make a point. Like, you don't even have to ask me, you know, go. And I don't mind, you know, the other thing is take part in a community, kind of like Yay Plus or online, like you meet other people. Right. And that's part of the career advice is start to build a network of people you can reach out to. I reach out to Emiko. Emiko, I have a question about this. And she turned me on to YouTube shorts, Yeah, you know, and, and I was like, oh, I created, and it got, I, I was on the short shelf last week, had a video where just for two days, the views went crazy, you know, right. so create a network of people as well. You know, you can learn on YouTube, uh, you know, case in point would be, I started playing house concerts as a mainstay of what I play, you know, where I play in people's homes. Mm. They're more lucrative than playing at a bar and you have people there listening. They literally are there for the music and it's a great way to connect with people. Well, the way I learned how to book my tours, I went online and I looked for house concert tours and I found this guy, Kevin Montgomery, whose father played with Buddy Holly and Kevin Montgomery, I he did 50 days in, 50 states in 50 days. He'd do all around the country for two months. He'd just go crazy. And I reached out to him and I said, how do you do that? And we got on the phone and he told me. So, you know, you, you can also reach out to these people who are creating and say, can I, can I talk to you about this? A lot of them will give you the time, you know? Right. <clears throat> so Matt, you also talk about uh, you. I, I also uh, check out some of your podcast episodes and, uh, and you also talk about social media, which is a very, you know, uh, how do I put it? It's, it, 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 sometimes it can be very tragic in how, how people use it. Uh, what do you think about the situation of social media nowadays? Well, it's noisy for sure. You know, you, you have to cut through the noise and it's funny because I, I've kind of let that podcast laugh. I've won laps. I've won for careers as well in technology that has on 40 episodes or something. And, but one of the things that, you know, once again, it's, 
it's challenging because it's noisy, but by the same token, um, I think what people have to do, look, I can be controversial online. I try not to be gratuitously angry, which I'm not, mm. um, but I express viewpoints and I can challenge viewpoints and I have no problem with that. But I also think that there are, that people who want to create, um, yeah, I saw a YouTube video the other day and I'm, I'm creating more video now that I have an official artist channel on YouTube. That's a new, new thing for me. And my other channel has technology stuff and had music stuff and, and you actually get graded down on that in social media, like YouTube doesn't lift your video. So mm -hmm. you want to focus your videos a bit. Um, so, you know, I, I guess what I would say, cause I saw, I, I saw this one video and it was so true. He said, look, rather than watching me tell you how to create your YouTube channel or your video, my advice would be go take a pad of paper, go upstairs and brainstorm and come up with ideas for your own content. Mm. Create something that people will want to listen to or pay attention to or watch. And, you know, it seems obvious, but I think that's the challenge with social media is too many people are trying to look in a rearview mirror and say, oh, they, they had success doing that. I'm going to do that. Oh, they had six and they're kind of constantly chasing rather than go, wait a second, what am I about? And let me create content that reflects me. And then let me see how the audience responds to that. I'm not saying don't understand the technology, don't make things, don't learn how to edit things nicely. I'm just saying people probably spend too much time online in general, not creating their own stuff. But secondly, not having enough confidence or faith in what they can create to go, wait a second, I don't need to copy so-and-so. I don't need to watch another Gary Vaynerchuk video on how to you know, do social media, right? Like mm. I've watched more than enough and I'm not saying he's wrong, he's right, but I probably don't need to hear the message again of, yeah, you need to be out there posting. Oh, I know I need to be do that. I now need to sit down and brainstorm and create my own thing, right? Right. <clears throat> now, so, if your uh, question was also, and I apologize, I probably diverted on the <laughs> conflict that's going on. You know, I, I'm not sure how that gets solved. Certain platforms are better about it than others. Yeah. You know? Right. <clears throat> so, so Matt, actually, I got to know you from uh, uh, when you when you were doing this uh, episode. Uh, a plus uh, interview with M Emiko, all right? So can you tell me how did you met Emiko and how did this A plus journey started? Sure. Um, so I've known Emiko for a long time. When I lived downtown uh, in downtown LA, actually I probably met her before I moved downtown, but soon, right before. We were both speaking at uh, Musicians Institute as part of the Independent Music Conference. And so we ran into each other as there was like a orientation for people doing workshops or something. And she knew of me and I knew of her. We had maybe connected on some kind of social platform. I don't know if it was MySpace or maybe it was Facebook or something. I knew of her, but we had never had any conversation. And at the time she was living between England and New York. But she would come to LA to record occasionally and also to make videos. She'd make her music videos out here. And so, um, you know, we, we kind of had this funny interaction uh, right at the conference and she goes, oh, let me buy you a coffee. So we went over to McDonald's, she bought me a coffee and we just started the friendship. And so when she would come to LA, I had an extra room at my house. I, my daughter and I lived in this three bedroom house we rented while she was going to this performing arts school. And I actually got, Emiko came and spoke at the performing arts school. She spoke for a couple of the music uh, rooms, which was really cool. And so um, we just maintained that friendship. But we, you know, she'd come out, my kids were in her music video. I was, you know, there, I think my feet walked by in one of her videos or something, you know? <laughs> so, um, and we just, yeah, we just developed friendship and she would challenge me. She's like, you know, you've got all this material. I have a lot of songs. I've written a lot. I've probably written an album worth of songs since 
January 1st. And they've written a lot of music, just wrote a song two days ago that I, I like. It's it's good. And you know, I'm pretty happy with it. And so she she go, you need to be getting your music more fully produced and you can do it. You know how to do this. You record at home. Her she challenged me because I'll write a song, I'll start to record it, I'll just get an acoustic track laid down, some vocals. And then I've written another song. And for every songwriter, your favorite song is your next song, right? So then I'd move on to that song. And I, that song, my last song would be an orphan. It would just be sitting there lonely going, wait a second, I thought you were going to do something with me. And so a few years ago, she said, two songs a month, just produce them more. You, you, you can play the bass, you can play the keys, you can, you know, you can, you have everything you need to make make this happen and you can get that stuff placed you know you've got a lot of strong material so that was our friendship and then um i saw when she was with i think boulevard and i i didn't hear a lot about it but when she started with yay she seemed very excited and we were having a conversation i was having a conversation with her about a song i was writing and she goes matt you should be a yay plus artist and that was the song christmas heart that we did together right so she uh she, we just had a phone conversation and she said, look, I, I'm going to put you in front of John and here's what we're looking for. And that, that's really how that started. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, although that's Christmas heart. Uh, I think you release it in December, right? Yeah. 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 So although it's, a, it's supposed to be a Christmas song, but I really love, love, love it. It's, it's a great song. <laughs> I, I appreciate that very much. It, it was fun because I I wrote it the year prior and I, there's a backstory to it. Um, I have a son who struggled with addiction and he's a, uh, um, a vet. And so, you know, I had changed my attitude with my oldest son kind of giving me some insight and reading some books and where, you know, I, I got tired of battling the addiction with anger or with shame or you need to get your life together. And I realized, wait a second, you know, we all have the things we struggle with and I'm not, my son needs to know I love him. And even if that's his choice, if that's where he's going to be, then I'm going to try and meet him there. And so I would just spend time with him on the street. And I got to know all these people that are on the street. I still talk to him today. I have 20 people in my phone that are all people that live on the streets. And I try and stay in touch with them and check in um, because the one thing, you know, usually they can get food. There's plenty of people that help with food and they can get clothing, even though I bring a lot of socks out there. But what they don't often get is somebody who sits down and just talks to them like they're a human being. Right. You know, just with whatever flaws they have, just goes, hey, what's going on? What, you know, and I'll ask them, you know, just various people on, you know, like, what do you, what do you like, you have any vision for your life? And, if you ever do, if you want some help with that, give me a call. Like we can talk about it, you know? Uh, so anyways, that's where that line came in the song. That was the first line I wrote. I was there and I, I was just, it was around Christmas time of 2019. And I saw, um, you know, these people living under the freeway in LA where on the freeway, I knew packages were going back and forth for Christmas and gifts and next day delivery with Amazon and all that stuff. And that's where that line came up where I said, uh, there's a freeway, there's a mother, or there's a baby, there's a mother, there's a freeway they're living under, carries the same day package delivery for all of that. I've been good, what will it get me? And it was just a way of me seeing this juxtaposition of what was right underneath the commerce, you know, right underneath the business of life happening, there were these people living in tents that had a whole different life, you know? Yeah. Um, so Matt, what's our, what's happening? So I know that you also released another song call on it now also in 2021. So yeah. plus you're doing a lot of stuff with the A plus. So can you tell me what's, what's upcoming, what we can look, look, look out for? Sure. Um, so one of the things is Arrogant Sage was in the studio a lot in 2019 and 2018, actually with Emiko's um, uh, guitarist and producer, Jamie Hamburg. 
Uh, he did some recording of my drummer. So I don't record drums. I, I can record everything else here. I have a studio set up here in this room or take stuff in the living room. And so I'm just recording guitar parts, vocals and other things, but all my drums are done at another studio. And so I've got stems, I've got tracks for about 14 songs right now. And what I've been doing, I, I, we're, I'm getting ready to release a song called Everyday Lives, um, which the band has been performing for years um, that I wrote. And then I'm going to start releasing some, uh, you know, I, I think on your list, you have The Night Is Calling. That song's going to be finished. Um, that was done also with the band. So that will be an Arrogant Sage song. Mm -hmm. And um, and really with the chan the YouTube channel, I've committed to doing a video, at least a video every week. We're actually sitting down tomorrow to come up with what our schedule is going to be. And I'm getting some assistance with video editing. I mean, I can do all the video editing, but I've only got... As I, as I told uh, um, my girlfriend and my daughter the other day, I said, look, I've only got 28 hours in a day and I'm already using 33 of them. So we, you know, I need to divvy up some of this work, right? And so even though I do the editing on my videos now, Debbie did the lyric video for um, uh, take, take Your Cares Away. But I can do that, but really I should be creating content and working on the music. So my daughter's going to take over video editing and, you know, uh, Debbie's doing the graphics and we're, we're looking at creating a team out of this. Right. And so uh, and that was the other thing is hopefully if things continue to open up, we'll be doing a um, small venue tour and house concert tour in, just at the end of summer. Right, great. <clears throat> so Matt, uh, what's your message to the viewers of this uh, video? Yeah, you know, look, um, I mean, I'd love to have them check out my stuff, but if it's not my stuff, find find an independent artist um, and do something to you know support them, whether it's just listening and sharing it with other people. I mean, I'd love for it to be me. Follow my YouTube channel, that'd be awesome. Right. Uh, but um, uh, you know, and hopefully I can give you compelling entertainment for that and information. But the reality is if it's not me, there's some other artists that is out there in the grind. And um, if they have a Patreon channel, you know, like, you know, give five bucks a month. Doesn't have to be a lot, you know, go buy the album, you know, buy, um, uh, you know, support them in some way, send them a message that says, Hey, I really like this. You know, that that's, that's a great thing too, you know, and, so that, that would be my message to anybody is, is just support the arts in some way, find the ones you like. And, and, and yeah, I'm not saying don't support the big names. Like I, there's nothing wrong with it, but they kind of have it going on mm. and there's somebody else you may not realize. It might be the person that, you know, was busking outside of the store and they might have just great material. You know, there's, there's, there's some amazing talent out there. So Find some of it and support it by sharing it with somebody else. Right. <clears throat> Anybody you want to shout out to? Oh, who would I do a shout out to? Well, Amico, of course, you know. Um, and uh, Jim Pipkin, and and that's something I would recommend. Like I, I've I've done a lot to support him. I buy his albums. He's a songwriter that is in Arizona, an amazing storyteller. Um, so uh, I'll let him know I made this shout out. But if anybody gets a chance to, um, Jim, if you get a chance to watch this, thank you for your encouragement. When I started playing out, it meant the world. Right. <clears throat> so Matt, thanks for joining this. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, this conversation. Uh, keep making great music and uh, looking forward to talking to you in the future when you have, you know, more music things coming up. Uh, just tell everyone how they can follow you on YouTube and all your social media. Sure. Um, if you go to MatthewMoranOnline.com, all the links will be there for all the social media right at the top of the page. Um, so the new YouTube channel, I did, I think I, I changed the link from the old channel to the new artist channel. It's up there, but if you search me, look for Matthew Moran, but MatthewMoranOnline.com, you can find me there. And um, yeah, say hello. If you hear 
you know, if you join from this podcast, I'd love for you to um, let me know. That'd be awesome. Thank you, Matt. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it.